going on everyone i hope this video finds you well my name is jonathan Bridell, and today we are going to talk about the jordan wigner transformation this transformation is extremely useful as it allows you to transform from spin one half degrees of freedom to fermionic degrees of freedom this in several cases can aid in finding exact solutions to models like the transverse field ising model or more generally the xy model we will cover these models in detail in the future for sure, uh, but for now we will cover the Jordan-Wigner transformation as a standalone topic. Before we completely jump into it, let's motivate what we're trying to do here. Let's imagine two chains, uh, one with spin one half degrees of freedom and one with fermions. We will label the sites in each chain as J is equal to one, two, and so on uh, to the capital letter L for length. If we zoom in at one site, in both cases, we see a degree of freedom that has two levels. For the lattice site with spin degrees of freedom, our spin can either be up or it can be down. For the fermion example, due to the Pauli exclusion principle, we either have one fermion in the state or we don't have a fermion in the state. So right away, these two physical situations seem analogous in some capacity, but as we will see, they're not straightforwardly analogous if we consider the whole system instead of just one single lattice site. For the spin degrees of freedom, we can define the usual observables for each individual lattice site. That is the spin in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction for each lattice site j. To relate these to fermionic uh, creation and annihilation operators, it's convenient to introduce the raising and lowering oper operators uh, written here in terms of sums of the x and the y component of the spins. These expressions are pretty standard. As you've probably seen in the past, these raise and lower the spin. So if you, for example, apply a raising operator S plus to a down state, it becomes an up state. And the rest of the expressions here are analogous. Interestingly, these raising and lowering operators also have the following anti-commutation relation with each other uh, when these two operators are taken to be on the same site. But if they are on different sites, that is, our index j and k are not equal to each other, these raising and lowering operators commute with each other rather than anti-commute with each other. So this is a key thing to appreciate. That is, that, these, uh, that the same site operators obey anti-commutation relations while the operators on different sites obey commutation relations. It is regularly convenient to transform a problem to degrees of freedom which obey the same type of algebra, either bosonic or fermionic. So moving on, the square of these matrices uh, of these raising and lowering operators is also zero. We can also write the Z operator in terms of the raising and lowering operators as the following expression. This is basically all we need to know about the spin operators to move on to fermions. So fermions have creation and annihilation operators, which work just like raising and lowering operators. Another operator that will seem related to the spin Z operator is the number operator, seen here as nj is equal to fj dagger, the raising operator, times fj, the annihilation operator, which tells us the number of fermions in a particular state associated with the lattice site j. The creation and annihilation operators are similarly zero if you square them. And for operators of the same site, we have the following anti-commutation relation, which is identical to the raising and lowering operators from the spins. So at this point in the discussion, it might be tempting to try and write down the following relations. That is that the creation operator is the same as the raising operator, the annihilation operator is identical to the lowering operator, and the spin z operator is related to the number operator, subtracting off uh, one half here, where the one half really means one half times the identity operator. But the problem with this is that as soon as we have more than one possible lattice site for a fermion to sit in, this breaks apart. This breaks apart because fermions need to obey anti-commutation relations with not only their same site operators between the annihilation and the creation operators, 
but also for all other lattice sites. That is, they must obey the following anti-commutation relations. So despite this difference, Jordan and Wigner in 1928 showed that spin operators for the whole chain can be represented exactly in terms of fermionic operators uh, by the following mapping. So some important things to note about this expression is that inside the exponential function, we have the, uh, the sum that runs for all fermionic sites from 1 to j minus 1, where j is the index of the spin operator that we are mapping onto fermions. So this is a highly non-local transformation. From these definitions, we can very easily read off that our initial intuition about the Z operator uh, was actually true, and it is in fact the number operator minus one half. So these three relations give us the Jordan-Wigner transformation. But before we end the video here, let's derive some useful results. These results will help us later when we solve the XY model for magnetism. Firstly, let's note that the number operators commute with each other, even if they're on different lattice sites. Also, for any non-zero positive integer n, we have that if we take the number operator to the power of n, we just recover back the number operator. And if we raise it to the power of zero, uh, the number operator, that is, we get back 1. With this in mind, we can simplify the exponential expression in the transformation. Since all the number operators commute, we can separate the exponential function, or the sum, into a product of exponential functions. So now that we have the exponential functions all on their own, uh, and there's no sum in the exponential, we can now take a Taylor series expansion, expansion of one of the terms in the big product. So because of our pre the previous identities that we've worked out, we know how to deal with these terms, and we can rewrite the sum in the following way. This then simplifies a little bit as we know what the sum in the brackets becomes. And then this, of course, is reduced to the following expression, which is just 1 minus 2 times a number operator. This allows us to fully rewrite the exponential uh, in the transformation as the following product, which is much easier to deal with analytically. Since the terms in the brackets um, inside the product are either uh, an identity or a number operator, the order at which we do this product actually doesn't matter. Another useful identity that you can work out is that each individual term in the product, um, if you square that, you get back the identity. This is seen quite straightforwardly from the properties of the number operators. This then leads us to two important conclusions that will be useful to us in the future. First, the square of the exponential expression that we've written here as qj is just one, or the identity. And the other is that the neighboring q's reduce to the following expression. So if we had, for example, a spin, a spin flip term in our Hamiltonian and wanted to map it to fermions, we would write the following expression uh, with our transformation. Note here the qj times the qj plus 1 in between our creation and annihilation operators for the fermions. Using our previous identities that we've worked out, we can then uh, rewrite this spin flip term in terms of the following creation annihilation operators. And we know the fact that the square of a fermionic creation or annihilation operator is always zero. So this tells us that the nearest neighbor spin flipping term in a Hamiltonian is equivalent to a nearest neighbor hopping term for fermions. The Jordan-Wigner transformation is a key tool in quantum many-body physics and is definitely worth learning. The content of this video will allow us to solve, for example, the transverse field Ising model, as I said previously, um, in a later video, so I definitely look forward to that. Uh, but that's it for today, guys. I hope you liked the video. If you did, feel free to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below.